In an interview, singer and songwriter Garth Brooks said or confessed that for the first two years of his first marriage, he occasionally thought about his high school sweetheart and wondered if maybe he should have married her instead of his wife. He remembered fervently praying for his sweetheart to love him as much as he loved her, but despite thinking their relationship was perfect, things just didn't work out. According to Brooks, a chance meeting with that high school sweetheart at a homecoming football game years later opened his eyes to the gift unanswered prayers can be. In the lyrics of the song, which was inspired by this meeting called Unanswered Prayers, the conversation between the two former lovers was described as incredibly awkward. They had changed so much, they could hardly remember their past relationship. And Garth Brooks realized that his memories of that relationship were idealized, and that his love for his wife is a totally different kind of love, the kind that you build a marriage on. The song is summed up with a line that describes what Garth Brooks learned about prayer. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. When we pray, like Garth Brooks, we have no way of knowing how our lives will go, what choices we will make from a week from now, or let alone a year from now, how we're gonna handle changes, or losses, or joys. Sometimes there is a reason our prayers are not answered. Or in the example of Garth Brooks' song, the answer is no. Ultimately, unanswered prayers are a reminder, like we heard from our first reading in the psalm, that God is God, and we are not which might be what is going on in today's gospel lesson where two of Jesus' disciples, two brothers, approached him in a side conversation, maybe you're familiar with those kinds of side conversations, and stated their desire. James and John were part of what scholars and commentators refer to as Jesus' inner circle. Sometimes Jesus would leave the crowds and the disciples behind when he went off to heal someone, or to uh, do some other miracle. But he would take a few of his disciples with him, and that was James, John, and Peter. That means those disciples had seen firsthand what the rest of them only got to hear about. Things like the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead and the transfiguration of Jesus on a mountaintop. So their experience of Jesus was a little more intense than that of the other disciples. Now, we don't know why Jesus chose to separate those three from the others. I don't know, maybe he wanted a small group to witness his miracles so they could describe or explain them to the others to help them figure out who Jesus really is. Maybe he understood that not every individual is able to process events in the same way and chose people he thought could understand what his miracles were pointing to. Like I said, we don't know Jesus' logic. But what today's side conversation might reveal is that whatever Jesus' intention was, it probably was different than what James and John saw. For after witnessing things they probably couldn't explain, it appears they did not see the servanthood love of God in action, repairing the breach between humanity and God. Instead, it seems they saw immense power and hierarchy and wanted to secure their place as close to the top as possible. Now it's real easy to fault the brothers for their request. Lots of essays, lots of commentaries, and many sermons have done just that. And instead, if we are honest, even though it's not as comfortable as demonizing them for their behavior, we might recognize it is behavior that we can relate to. It seems to me most scholars and commentators and many preachers don't seem to take into consideration all that James and John have gone through in such a short period of time. They chose to leave their father 
and his fishing business, the only life they knew to follow Jesus. That's a big change, and it's a choice that not many parents or friends or partners or spouses would support. There's no job security. There's no steady paycheck. There's not even housing provided. There was none of the stuff of privilege or status in following Jesus. Perhaps also for the first time in their lives, they may have been separated from their family and their community. And maybe sometimes they felt some grief because of that separation. In addition to that dramatic change in their lives, they saw Jesus wielding a power they didn't understand. The power to restore wholeness to the ill, family and community to the estranged, even life to the dead. They saw crowds fed from mere bits of bread and fish. They witnessed Jesus meeting with Moses and Elijah in the strangest in-person conference ever. They saw Jesus walk on water and stop a raging storm simply by telling it to be still. Now all of this is evidence of who Jesus is and the change he was bringing into the world. But we humans, well, we have a love-hate relationship with change. We sometimes say we want it, we long for it, we pray for it. However, when the change actually happens, most often there is an adjustment period where we feel uncomfortable because we don't always know what to do. Old habits or patterns of behaviors don't work like they used to when things have changed. Just ask parents of a new baby or child about that, or someone who gets a brand new job in a totally different part of the country. We humans tend to respond to the stress caused by change, especially multiple changes that happen at the same time, by hoping and praying that the world we know really hasn't changed, even if it was the change we had prayed for. Think about the story of the Israelites leaving slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. As soon as that excitement of the whole Red Sea event was over, they started to whine and complain about everything from the food to the leadership. They began to remember slavery as a way to get free housing and food, and so longed to return. Freedom was the change they had prayed for, but it was just too uncomfortable to live into because they didn't know how to live as free people. However, once a change happens, there just is no going back, like the Red Sea, like Jesus walking on water, and of course, the resurrection. Once Jesus rose from the dead, all that stuff of hierarchy and prestige, while it is still around and might still be what we are most familiar with, it is not the glory of God in Christ, and it is not, according to what Jesus said in our gospel today, how Christians are to order our lives. The glory of Jesus is not in his miracles. The glory of Jesus is what so many find too uncomfortable to look at the cross. When Jesus was crucified, he forever eradicated the notion that God was going to participate in the power structures, economics, and politics we humans have created to manage the world. God is not like that. In the cross, we see God is not afraid. God is not afraid to suffer with that which God created because God loves what God created. That's just a long way of saying God loves you. God is part of the world, not separate from it. This is why Jesus told James and John in our gospel that one day they wouldn't drink. One, one day they would indeed drink from the same cup and be baptized in his baptism. They are going to suffer. They will die proclaiming the gospel. But as to who will be on his left and his right, well, those are not actually places of prestige like a first officer in the military or a canon to the ordinary in a diocese, like the disciples might have imagined. When Jesus was crowned in his glory, on his right 
and on his left were two criminals who were also crucified that same Good Friday. This means the purpose of our faith is not to force the crucifixion of Jesus into any human system of self-help or consumerism. The crucifixion wasn't a setback. Jesus went through and then came out all right in the end. It wasn't like an injury he bounced back from and then went on as if nothing had happened. The resurrection didn't fix a problem by buying supplements at a drugstore or ordering that one special thing from Amazon Prime. The resurrection is not restoring life to the way it was before the crucifixion. The resurrection is the beginning of a new life, one with Christ in its center. One that turns everything we understand as normal, upside down and inside out. One that sounds good, but in reality can be uncomfortable and difficult to live into. Because it can be hard to figure out what to do, how to live resurrection life, especially because it's nothing we actually fully understand. However, every once in a while, we might encounter someone who gives us an idea of what it can look like. In Tracy Chevalier's 2019 novel, A Single Thread, she introduces her readers to a character named Miss Pezel, who was based on a woman who lived in Egypt in the 1930s, who among many other achievements, created and oversaw guilds of women who made embroidered cushions for cathedrals. When introducing Louisa Pezel, Chevalier wrote that she was the kind of leader who was comfortable in her authority and didn't have to put others down in order to make herself feel like a leader. And throughout the novel, we see what the author meant as her character nurtures and encourages and challenges other women to learn an art that you can still see if you visit places like Winchester Cathedral. Ms. Pazell did not need to compete for power. She shared it, and in so doing, together with many other women, created some lasting beauty. But I confess we're probably getting ahead of ourselves. James and John will get there eventually, but they weren't ready for such a life when they pulled Jesus aside and stated their desire to be his first and second in command. While not literally a prayer, their conversation can look like a lot of prayers. You know, the kinds that petition God for things that perhaps we either aren't ready for or just aren't in line with resurrection life. The kind of prayers that might be more about the fear and frustration that comes with changes and might be what we wanted but don't know how to live into. Prayers that express our tendency to double down on things we don't realize give us comfort, like prestige and hierarchy, simply because we are familiar with them and that familiarity gives us comfort in times of stress. And when that happens, like with James and John in today's gospel, or even with Garth Brooks back in his old high school days, perhaps we might have a more compassionate understanding as to why the answer to some prayers is no. Such unanswered prayers are not evidence of a God who doesn't care, nor are they proof that God doesn't exist. Instead, they are God with us in times of change or suffering, reminding us God ways are not to partner with those in power. God walks with and lifts up the humble. Today we find ourselves living in the midst of not just one, but many changes. I often witness evidence, and sometimes feel it myself, of fatigue, frustration, and a desire to go back to the way things were before, whatever that time is ideally remembered to be. It can be difficult to have compassion for ourselves and others when we feel this way. It's difficult to envision how to adapt our ministries and our lives. It's difficult to have patience when we see programs that used to be effective and aren't anymore, and we don't have a simple, easy to follow template to fix that problem. And it can feel like just too much work to even try. And like Garth Brooks and James and John, we might pray for things that are in line with systems we know ultimately to be unjust or wrong, but we go to them because they are familiar and that gives us comfort. 
And that's why we might start to scapegoat or blame certain parts of our population for our struggles because of whatever and who or whoever they are are not doing or are doing. But as comfortable as those mindsets are, they are not the stuff of resurrection life that calls us to live differently. A life that is to be lived in service to God. Perhaps all the unanswered prayers of our lives are really guiding us gently towards that resurrection life. Perhaps all our unanswered prayers are in a way bringing God's kingdom where things like inequality become a memory closer to us all. So maybe the song has it right. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers.